Next, we'll look at another non-standard problem. So in this case, this problem is non-standard because it has one uh, non-standard inequality. Here, the inequality is facing the variable side rather than the constant side. Notice that x1 is also omitted from the non-negativity assumption down here at the bottom. That's just because it would be redundant to say that x1 needs to be bigger than or equal to 0 because we already require that x1 is bigger than or equal to 8. So we don't really need that last one. So first, let's figure out how to translate this into its initial simplex tableau, and then we'll talk through the phase one and phase two steps. I'm again going to be going quickly over the row operations here, but we'll at least talk about how to set up the problem and then how to choose the row operations that we want. So what I would do is I would first rearrange the objective row so that all of the variables appear on this left side. So we'd get negative 40x1 minus 60x2 minus 80x3 plus p equals 0, where p is this thing that we're trying to optimize. Now for our constraints, these first two constraints are just going to get ordinary slack variables because those are standard constraints. So the first constraint equation would be 15x1 plus 12x2 plus 9x3 plus our first slack variable is equal to 240. Similarly, for the second one, I'd get 150x1 plus 250x2 plus 350x3 plus our second slack variable is equal to 3,000. So that's how to convert those first two uh, inequalities into equalities. Now, for our last constraint, notice that because the inequality faces the wrong way, this time we need a surplus variable. So I need to subtract a surplus variable. That will be S3 to turn that into an equality. And that's all that we need for the setup. So we can already write down the initial simplex tableau. I'll go ahead and label the columns just for convenience. So we have x1, x2, x3. We also have s1, s2, and s3, which are our surplus and slack variables. And then we're going to omit the variable that we want to uh, be maximizing here. And instead, I'm just going to label that last column as p. We'll identify p with the bottom right value here. And now our first three rows I'm going to translate. So we have a 15, 12, 9, 1, and then 0, 0, 240. That's our first constraint equation translated. So remember that we start by translating the constraint equations, and then the objective row goes last. So that's our first constraint equation. Our second constraint equation looks like this. 0, 1, 0, 3,000, because that one uses the second sur or sorry, slack variable. And then this row is a little bit strange because this is our third constraint. So this will, will look like 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then the coefficient on S3 is a negative 1. So we'll get a negative 1 there. Whoops. And then lastly, I can translate our objective row. That should give us a negative 40, negative 60, negative 80, and then zeros all the way. Because remember, I'm not recording the coefficient of p. I'm just recording the value of p at the beginning, which is 0. That's given by this right side of the initial equation. OK, so this is what we get as our initial simplex tableau. But notice that if I were to read off the values of the variables right now, what I would get is that S3 is equal to negative 8 at the beginning. And therefore, I am in phase 1, because I'm trying to fix that negative value. I need to get into the feasible region first before I can proceed with the ordinary simplex method. So here what I'm going to do is I will show you how to pivot and which row operations should result from that. But again, what I want you to do is, for this problem especially, just sort of trust me that these are what you get, that these rows are what you get from the individual row operations. Don't try to keep up with the row operations mentally. I'm not doing them mentally. I, I just have them already on scratch paper off to the side, just so that this video isn't um, gigantic. So uh, what we need to do is we need to fix this negative 1 value. So in phase 1 pivoting rules, I look at the negative 1 that I want to fix, and I look to its left. 
and I choose the uh, largest positive value that I can see to its left. In this case, there's only one positive value to its left, and it's way over here. So that tells me what my pivot column has to be. My pivot column is this one. To compute my pivot row, what I have to do is compute the quotients like we did before. And remember, the quotient is this far right value divided by any positive values that live in this current column. So those quotients would end up being 240 over 15, which is 16, and then 3,000 divided by 150, which is 20, and then 8 divided by 1, which is 8. You choose the least of these, and that tells you your pivot row. So because 8 is the least, our pivot row is this one, and that means that 1 is our pivot. So that's our pivot. We pivot like we normally would. So I want to zero out the rest of the entries in that column. And again, what I'm going to do is I'll write down what the row operations should be, but then I'm just going to write the resulting rate matrix immediately. So for that top row, I would want to take row 1 minus 15 times our pivot row. For the second row, I'm going to take row 2 minus 150 times our pivot row. And to fix that negative 40 in the fourth row, I would take the fourth row plus 40 times our pivot row. And in the resulting matrix, our pivot row will stay the same. We haven't changed the pivot row. So the pivot row still looks like that. And the resulting other rows are going to look like this. So I have a 0, negative 60, negative 80, uh, 0, 0, negative 40, 320 as my bottom row. And then for the other rows, what I have is a 0, 12, 9, 1, 0, 15, 120, and a 0, 250, 350, 0, 1, 150, 1800. So just trust me on those values. So this is what we get after pivoting. And if you'd like, you can relabel these um, columns just to help you read off the values of the variables. But in order to decide whether we need to proceed, we need to ask whether we're out of phase one. So remember, phase one, what we were trying to do was to correct any negative values that we had in our surplus variables. We only had one, which was this S3 is equal to negative eight. And if I look at the values of S1, S2, and S3 right now, they're all at least zero. Notice that S3 is now non-basic, so S3 would equal zero at this stage. And that means that, therefore, we are in phase two. So S3 equals zero implies that we're in phase two. In other words, from this point on, we should just proceed using the ordinary simplex method that we talked about last time. So now we're using ordinary simplex method rules. That means we're looking for the largest negative indicator. That tells us our pivot column. So that would, well, that's a little long. So this will be our pivot column. And then to decide the pivot row, I need to compute all those quotients like I did before. So I'm actually going to scroll up a little bit here. So this is our pivot column. There are only two positive entries in that pivot column. So those are the only two quotients that I need to be worried about. But I do need to compute those quotients. So for the first quotient, I would get a 120 divided by 9. That's like a 13.5. And then I would get an 1800 divided by 350. That is, I guess, 5 point something. And because the five point something is smaller, this will be our pivot row. So notice that these quotients don't always have to work out especially nicely. So they don't have to be whole numbers or anything. We would still just take the smaller of these. That will tell us where our pivot is located. In this case, our pivot is this 350. And now we need to turn the pivot into a one. And we also need to eliminate the rest of the non-zero entries in that column. So to turn the pivot into a 1, I would take row 2 and divide it by 350. So that's my first step. And then once that is resolved, 
So pretend that 350 is a 1. The next thing that I would want to do is kill this 9 and negative 80. So I'm going to do this all in one row operation just to save some time. So to kill that 9, I would want to take row 1 and subtract 9 times the resulting pivot row. And to kill the negative 80, I would want to take the bottom row and add 80 times the resulting pivot row. So I'm going to do all of these row operations at the same time. And when we do that, what we end up with is kind of a messy answer. So notice that I'm dividing by 350 in that second row. So this is going to cause some fractions. I don't plan on giving you exam questions that involve um, fractions that are this unwieldy. Uh, so that's part of the reason that I want you to just sort of coast for now and not worry about verifying that this is what we get at the end of the row operations. But this is what I got. So I'm going to write these as fractions. If you'd like, though, you can write them as decimals if you don't want to deal with fractions. However, I think in either case, you're going to get some messy answers. Oops, that's a one. So again, for this problem, just sort of trust me that this is what we end up getting. Notice that the third row here did not change, so it's still going to be exactly the same. And our new objective row is 0, negative 20 sevenths, 0, 0, 8 thirty fifths, and negative 40 sevenths, with our current p-value of 51 20 sevenths. So I don't want you to freak out about any of these values. You know, I, I don't like working with giant denominators or even seven as a denominator. So I, I don't want you to stress about having to deal with complex fractions like this. Um, but I do want us to understand how to proceed from here. So remember that we're in phase two, which is just the ordinary simplex method. And at this stage, what we see is that we still have some negative indicators. So I look at these indicators, and I see that there are two negative indicators. I choose the most negative, which is this one that tells me my pivot column. And then I need to select my pivot row. To do that, I need to compute these quotients. Now, I only compute the quotients for the entries in this column that are positive. So that would be these two. So I'm going to compute two quotients. It'll be the far right value divided by this value. So 516 sevenths divided by 78 sevenths. That's the same thing as 516 divided by 78, which is like a 6.6. .6. And then the second quotient will be equivalent to 36 fifths, which I guess is 12. No, that can't be right. Oh, sorry, I copied this down wrong. This is not a 5, this is a 3. There we go. So this will be 36 thirds, which is 12. And now we choose the least of the quotients. That tells me my pivot row. So this will be my pivot row, and therefore my new pivot is 78 sevenths. Okay, so now what I need to do is I need to turn that into a 1 by dividing by 78 sevenths, which is the same thing as multiplying by its reciprocal. So I can take 7 78ths and multiply it by row 1. That will turn the pivot into a 1. And then once the pivot is a 1, I need to eliminate these three other entries that live in that column. And to fix a 3 sevenths, what I would do is I would subtract 3 sevenths times the pivot row. To fix a negative 1, I would add a positive 1 times the pivot row. And to fix a negative 40 sevenths, I would add a 40 sevenths times the pivot row. So this is what we end up getting after that row operation. <laughs> 
So you can see why I didn't want to do all of this by hand here. It Honestly, part of it is just that I don't think it's especially enlightening to do these row operations together. Like, I think it sort of detracts from what's going on overall. But you can also see that these answers are not especially clean. I definitely wouldn't give you an, uh, a problem of this type that's this horrible on an exam. Okay, we're almost there. Okay, so now our objective row is 0, 0, 0, 20, 30 ninths, 14, 60 fifths, 0, and 10,000 over 13. And if you are having trouble reading any of these, honestly, don't worry about it too much. The individual numbers are not that consequential. The main thing is just that we're getting used to applying this overall strategy. So we'll see more examples in a minute that involve some cleaner numbers, and that's where I want you to start paying attention to the numbers. But the main thing for now is just that we're able to understand the individual steps that we decided to take and understand when to stop. And now in this case, we knew we were in phase two. We're still in phase two. We're looking for the optimal solution here. I don't see any negative indicators, so that means we're actually done. And now I can just read off the optimal solution. So to read it off, I'm going to relabel the columns. I have x1, x2, x3, uh, s1, s2, s3, and then the thing that we were trying to optimize, which is p. Now, it looks like x2 is a non-basic variable. So I can delete that one. I'm actually going to do this in a different color just so that I can mark these out but still sort of read the columns. So x2 is non-basic, s1 and s2 are non-basic. So I can mark those off. We never mark off this column. This column is just going to tell us the values for each of the variables and also the value of p down here. So now I can read the values of the different variables. If I read off the value of x1, I would get 190 over 13. x2, because it's non-basic, its value is 0. x3, I can also read off as being 30 thirteenths. And we can also read our optimal p-value. The optimal p-value would be 10,000 divided by 13. And that would be my answer. It tells me the values of x1, x2, x3, and also the optimal p-value that we can get in this case.